The Justin Robert Young program brought to you as always by everybody who supports us at payjurydaily.com. Well, hello, YouTube. Welcome to another edition of the Justin Robert Young Daily Program. We are going to get started right here and right now. Got a lot to talk about, but you want to know what? Let's go ahead and just get in to the episode. Welcome, 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 everybody, to the, uh, another episode of Justin Robert Young Daily Program. My name is Justin Robert Young. Oh, back, finally, back in my studio, back in Oakland, back in California. Uh, the next flight I'm going to get on is international, but at least I got a bunch of days leading up from then to there, so... Uh, I'll be I'll be in the studio. No more traveling. No more crazy stuff. At least until I go away for uh, for a week or so. All right. Uh, this weekend, I, I had a very interesting weekend. This weekend, uh, my Contender Games co-creator John Teasdale came on up from uh, where he's living down there in San Diego now, uh, because he had forgotten that before he left, before he abandoned uh, the Bay Area. That he had signed up for the Bay Area Book Fair. All right, the Bay Area Book Fair. Now, I know a lot of you folks uh, don't live in the Bay Area. You are not aware uh, of what this might look like. But, but do me a favor. Everybody, if you are listening, unless you are uh, uh, driving, okay, close your eyes. Do me a favor. We're going to go through a little guided uh, uh, thought process here. Close your eyes. And imagine what you would think the Bay Area Book Fair would be. All right. You're walking through the Bay Area Book Fair. You, you, you feel a bit of the, the crisp weather on your, uh, on, your, on your skin. You know, it's around 55 to 60 degrees. Uh, Berkeley tends to be a little windy at times. Oh, yeah. By the way, it's in Berkeley. Right next to Berkeley High and City Hall. You know, maybe you look over to the side and you see a uh, a tent in one of the booths for the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. I mean, it is a book fair after all, so maybe there's a independent author there selling a political book for children called Make America Grape Again, wherein a misguided orange ruins the whole fruit salad and the grape has to save the day. Walk a little bit further. Maybe, uh, you know, Law and Order is here. Law and Order. The Berkeley Police Department, they have a booth here at the Bay Area Book Fair. And just like any police department, they've got their name on their tent. Except for the Berkeley Police Department, the font in which Berkeley Police Department is written is the same. I'm not kidding. As the Crystal Supply Store, the Tarot Card Supply Store in my neighborhood. Which, by the way, the most Bay Area thing that I have come to witness is at some point, the Tarot Supply Store underwent new management and it changed names from the Wishing Well to the Raven's Wing. Please update your address books accordingly. Oh, and then there we go. Uh, Justin Robert Young and John Teasdale hawking their cheap wares, selling action newses and contenders. Now, open your eyes and please be revealed that if you thought I was making jokes, I was indeed not. <laughs> this was exactly what the Bay Area Book Fair indeed looked like. Plenty of books on 
why socialism's the answer. Plenty of books on polyamory. Plenty of books on every other element of uh, uh, empathy and tolerance and how diversity is indeed our strength. Folks, it was every bit of parody that you might expect it to be. Well, actually, it wasn't because I was expecting things to be even more ridiculous. It was. It was. It, it would have been odd if somebody had never been around the Bay Area. But for me, I thought it was going to be a total, total waste of our time. If only because, I don't know, we were selling like a commercial product. <laughs> I, I figured that we would immediately, immediately be slotted next to Antifa's erotic fiction writing competition booth. And that everybody that would come up to us would just silently shame us for trying to sell a thing for money. But it wasn't. It was actually a really, really pleasant couple days. It was nice. We made a little bit of money. So that's good. Really, the only thing that sucked was uh, John had to drive all the way up from San Diego, which he did to to you know bring up our bring up all the 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 product that we were going to sell. And also to save a little bit of money, which, of course, he immediately <laughs> paid back because as he walks into my apartment on Friday afternoon, poor John Teasdale, he reveals to me that he has indeed locked his keys in his car. So after uh, some some YouTubing, trying to YouTube our way into the car, to, to, to break our way into the car, we uh, we then broke down and had to call a locksmith. Now, I'm going to tell you that what John eventually paid to that locksmith was $95. $95. We wound up finding... All the equipment that this guy used on Amazon. So here is my question to you, and I will reveal this information tomorrow. How much do you believe that equipment cost on Amazon? In total, it was two pieces of equipment. How much do you believe that it cost? Go ahead and hit me up, Jury Daily at gmail.com again jury daily at gmail.com but first Dot com again jury daily at gmail dot com but first news there we go I gotta make sure I get the uh the the echo on uh, on 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 the the mobile versions. Uh, otherwise, I was very pleased with how the mobile versions came out over last week. I feel like I'm I'm starting to get to the point where I can definitely do these fairly reliably on the road. But there's just a few creature comforts that I like, and that's that's that news that news drop is always so happy. All right, here we go. We now have scientific proof of who bullshits the most. Who is the biggest bullshitter? Well, science says it is three demographics. Boys, the wealthy, and Canadians. This according to Ars Technica. We read now from an article written by John Timmer. The existence of what's colloquially, colloquially known... Colloquially, colloquially known as... I just cannot say that. Colloquially known as bullshit, a combination of lies, exaggerations, and inaccuracies that makes it hard to figure out what the truth is, is familiar to all of us. Most of us have come across an individual so skilled in deploying it to advance their goals that we refer to them as bullshit artists. 
Given it's such a prominent aspect of human behavior, however, you might be surprised to learn that the field of bullshit studies is relatively young. Researchers trace BS back to an obscure 1986 essay by philosopher Harry Frankfurt, but it didn't pick up traction until we expanded to book form nearly 20 years later. Wait a minute. Fuck you. You're telling me that bullshit first came around in 1986, but we didn't pick up traction until it expanded to book form in 2006? Get the fuck out of here. I definitely heard bullshit before that. The show bullshit was on before that, right? Somebody look up for me Penn and Teller's bullshit. Penn and Teller's bullshit came on before 2006. And I remember watching it in college and I graduated in 05. This entire thing is bullshit. I'm going to continue reading anyway. Even then, seven years had to go by before other researchers expanded onto Frankfurt's theoretical framework and empirical studies have only really picked up over the last several years. Now, several group of social scientists, I don't know, some guys, have found a massive study that pulled 40,000 school students to find out who bullshits and why. The researchers use the phrase bullshit and bullshitters throughout, so we do too. Uh, Parker, Shore, and Jerem, the authors, acknowledge that uh, their study has never been used to compare participants across countries in terms of their proclivity to bullshit before, so they figured out how to do so. The 2012 test was focused on math and included a question about how familiar students were with 15 mathematical concepts. Thanks to our intrepid researchers, three of those concepts were completely non-existent, proper numbers, subjective scaling, and declarative fractions. Anyone claiming that they had mastered them was obviously bullshitting. So the results, be wary of North Americans. Each country was given an overall bullshit score based on its uh, take on the three fake subjects and controlled for things like actual mathematical achievement. Canada topped the list, followed closely by the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, with England bringing up the back of the pack in terms of their tendency to bullshit. Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland all ended up with negative scores. Although there are undoubtedly bullshitters in these three countries, apparently math isn't their preferred topic for exercising this artistry. Data show that boys in all the countries were more likely to claim that they've mastered the non-existent skill. The same held tro true for people with higher socioeconomic status who invariably engaged in some bullshitting. People at the lower end of the economic scale, by contrast, had a negative bullshit score in all the countries examined. But things aren't all bad for North Americans. They are remarkably egalitarian in their bullshit. Both the gap between genders and the gap between low and high socioeconomic statuses were the smallest in U.S. and Canada. The U.S. was also unique in that there was no significant gap between immigrants and native-born bullshitters. In other countries, immigrants were more likely, likely to claim that they knew the non-existent math. England, Ireland, and Scotland had the largest gender gaps, Scotland and New Zealand, the largest gap based on economic status, and the European countries all clustered together with larger differences between native populations and immigrants. Yes, bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to talk some bullshit. We are the United States, and we probably made some shit up. All right, let's go ahead and get into your emails. So here's something else uh, that I was actually kind of thinking about, uh, just because some of the email has slowed down a little bit, uh, and I realized that I was probably setting myself up a little bit too much uh, with doing like theme week so often, that maybe uh, uh, the new, the one thing that continues to come in, in in a higher volume than I can use them are the jury stories on the Discord. Uh, there are some awesome jury story folks that just put on put in jury stories into that Discord every single fucking day. So my thought was, what if the 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 new you know the, the the format of the show was I just read three jury stories and talk about them, and that way we can get my own personal stuff kind of in there. But at least there's something that people can expect that it's jury stories every day, and at, at the very at the very least, you guys can understand that I'll wrap around all the other shit that I normally talk about, but we'll have jury stories. 
No, no, no. Yeah, and fucking Penn and Teller's bullshit aired from 2003 to 2010. Fuck you. It only happened and spread wide in 2006. Fucking kick rocks. That's bullshit. I guess they're saying like, oh, the idea of a bullshit artist, maybe? I don't know. And we probably made some shit up. All right. Let's go ahead and get into your emails. You can always go ahead and email the show, jurydaily at gmail.com. We didn't get a bunch in over the weekend, but we do have some evergreens, including a neon signs. This one coming in anonymously, like they all do. If you have a neon sign story, you can always go ahead and send that one in. Specifically, if they happen currently, always love the current neon sign stories. If you're unfamiliar, the neon sign stories are when... You had a total, gigantic, flashing sign that somebody was interested in you either romantically or sexually, and you totally missed it until eventually looking back in your life, either by minutes, by days, by months, or by years, and realize that you had missed your opportunity. Here is this poor soul. It was 1999, and I was working on a national auto parts company's corporate office as part of a, the Y2K remediation. I had the easiest job in the world. There were a bunch of Russian programmers working there, and a bunch of them were working with me on the Y2K stuff. I chatted up a bunch of them in the six to seven months I was there, and everybody got pretty friendly. One in particular kept mentioning things in her sexy-voiced Russian accent. Oh, you know, in Russia... Marriages are almost always open. Huh, my thought, and went on with life. I left there and went to work on my next Y2K contract. And after a few weeks, I got a call from one of the women I worked with at the previous job. Apparently, Russians put a ka on the end of names as a term of endearment or to be super friendly. After getting the small talk out of the way and her mentioning that she was so bored all alone at home for a few days while her husband was traveling, she boldly said to me, again in her sexy voice, Russian accent, accent you know, Kriska, we never did fuck. Huh, I thought. She's right. We never did. Wait. Was that on the table, I thought? I said, huh, you're right. We never did. And that's it. <laughs> that's the end of the story. We talked to Pitt, got off the phone, and about an hour later it hit me that I, why I didn't just dr dive through the phone to take care of it. We never spoke again. From Russia with love, Kriska. From Russia with love. If you would like to write into this show, you can go ahead and do it at jurydaily at gmail.com. Thank you to everybody who sent in the jury stories for the week. Another Jay Martin is the man who brought us our jury story for today. I'd like to thank our producers that make this show possible. The Jen, Petey Rave, Non-Specific, Rock and Roll, Martian, Joe Acosta, well, James, the OG Brito, well, and Chris. You can uh, hit me up on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Justin R. Young, and you can join our Discord at bit.ly slash jury discord. Friends, that about wraps it up for us today. Until tomorrow, this is your old pal Justin Robert Young saying, please give a round of applause to Mr. Wacky, but more importantly, please don't die!
Please report to the jury box. Please report to the jury box. We are waiting for you in the jury box. Friends, that about wraps it up for us today. Until tomorrow, this is your old pal Justin Robert Young saying, please give a round of applause to Mr. Wack. But more importantly, please don't. Don't! Cool beans. One more piece of housekeeping. When does PX3 report, uh, record? Uh, that will record after Jury Daily, so 11 o'clock. Back to, everything's back to the way it used to be. Back to 11 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Uh, we begin the stream at 10, and then uh, 11 Pacific. All right, and that will uh, wrap it up for YouTube. Thank you guys so much. Tried to make it a little bit more telegenic uh, with me being the big, the big screen there. Uh, but until tomorrow, I'll see you guys later.